Hey everyone, I'm Kirby, this is Kirby Meets Audio, and today we're gonna have a little chit chat. Just some friendly one-on-one -on -one about frequency graphs. If you've been looking into speaker building or just how speakers work in general, you've probably seen one of these. It's a frequency graph. Let's talk about this graph for a second. Just like any graph, it's designed to give us the most relevant information with a quick glance. This graph shows the speaker amplitude or volume across the frequency spectrum. Down along the bottom, we have the spectrum of sound our human ears can hear. Starting on the left side is the base or low end of the spectrum at 20 hertz. That increases as you look to the right all the way up to 20,000 hertz, which is the top end or the highest frequencies some people can hear. So if you think about a drum kit, back down towards 20 hertz would be your big booming bass drums, and then up at 20,000 hertz would be your cymbals. Over on the left side of the graph along our Y axis will represent amplitude or volume of the frequency. The level is displayed in decibels or dBs. Basically, the higher the dB at any point on the graph, the higher the volume of that frequency it represents will be. We find these points by playing a specific frequency through the speaker and measure its amplitude. We place that point on the graph, then move on to the next frequency, and so on for the rest of the spectrum. Those points are then connected to complete the graph. So this is all done now in software, and each of these points are collected during a single sweep of the spectrum, like this. The software then analyzes the input from a calibrated mic and gives you an updated graph. All right, so what do we use these graphs for? Well, we use them in two ways. The first is to get a visual representation of the information we need to decide if a driver is right for our system. These graphs can also be turned into FRD files and can be used to simulate crossover configurations. The second is to see if our overall system is reproducing sound in the way we expected. I'm gonna be talking more about the second one today, a representation of our system's overall sound. So the goal for most speaker designers is to get a nice flat amplitude across the full frequency spectrum with a finished speaker. I don't think this can happen, but if they could get a perfectly flat amplitude line across the whole spectrum from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz, that would be a good thing, right? Because if that were possible, that would mean the speakers have zero impact on the sound of the music being played through them. You would get exactly what the artist intended. You can think of this like an EQ, like in iTunes or whatever. When you raise the slider on the high end, the music gets a little brighter. If you lower the high end and raise the mids, it gets a little boomier. But if you leave it flat, you don't change the sound at all. The physics of your speaker and how they are designed basically represents their own EQ. So this brings me to the kind of two schools of thought on sound reproduction. There's the purists and the colorists. So the purists would want their speakers to be super flat, like the impossible ones I just described. They want as close to zero influence on their music as possible from their speakers and setup. They want to hear exactly what the artist intended. And then maybe they'll manually EQ or tune their speakers to fit their room. While someone who enjoys color maybe boosts the bass a bit, or does what a lot of people do, they'll boost the bass and the highs, giving a sort of smiley face response graph. Even adding a tube preamp to your system is usually done to add some color to the sound, usually warmth that a lot of people enjoy from tube amps. Anything that changes the sound of your music is considered coloring it. Now this creates a pretty interesting split right now between the purists and pretty much everybody else. Lots of people consume their music today through Bluetooth speakers or modern headphones, and pretty much every one of those devices are tuned for color, because honestly, most people prefer a little boost in the bass and in the highs. So much so, in fact, the engineers that master albums will actually take this into account and adjust their mixes accordingly. The Sonos Beam I recently reviewed, right up there, is a great example of this. A lot of Sonos speakers have a distinct sound signature of being very warm and bass heavy because that's what they found people enjoy. I bring up these two camps because I want you to know that both are legitimate, and despite what anyone tells you, neither is the wrong way to design your speakers. Usually for DIY, getting a nice flat response graph is the goal because it gives you the most options later on. You can add some color to a flat speaker by using an EQ or a particular preamp or your record player versus a digital source. Or maybe you're building a Bluetooth speaker and you want it to be a little bass heavy, so you can design the crossover to add color by boosting the bottom end. My point is, 
just because a frequency graph isn't necessarily flat doesn't mean it's gonna sound bad. But this is tricky because not great sounding speakers can have crazy not straight graphs. And the same pair of speakers can sound great to one person and really bad to another person. So what does this all mean? Well, my point of view is that frequency graphs are a great representation of how speakers perform. And they're a necessary tool for designing speakers, but nothing replaces your ear. Speakers that sound good to you, and specifically you, despite what the graph says, are good speakers. I think the PS95 point source driver is a great example of this. As we talked about in my recent review of this driver, <laughs> looking at the top end of the graph shows a bright and not flat response, but to your ear, in reality, the top end sounds great. Sure, you can design a filter to fix this a bit, which I've done, but I honestly don't think you need to do that. You can play this driver straight up and it'll sound great. All right, so to wrap this up, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm saying designing a speaker with a choppy graph is okay, because it's not. You should be aiming for a flat graph, or if you know what you're doing, something with the color that you want. But just because a driver or a system doesn't have a perfectly flat graph doesn't mean it's trash. How the speaker sounds in real life to you is much more important than what it sounds like in a computer. If you're interested in building a pair of speakers of your own, head over to kmakits.com where you can find free build plans or complete build kits for purchase. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up. If you hated it, hit the thumbs down. Just, you know, get your feelings out. If you're new here and you like this video, please hit that subscription button and then hit that little bell if you want updates on when I post videos. I also have a Patreon where fans like you help me make videos like this one. And if you wanna see the behind the scenes of making these videos or my speaker building or just my life in general or the DIY speakers that I find randomly on Instagram, uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can search for Kirby Meets Audio or there's links down there. Thanks, just a little, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've been thinking a lot about graphs lately, and yeah, these points came to mind. Thought I'd share. All right, I'll see you guys later this week or next week. I don't know when this video is coming out, but there's gonna be a video soon. See ya.